Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that in you, you have provided for us, O oh God, a haven, a place that even in the midst of difficulty and pain and even violence, our hearts can be protected. So shield us as we gather tonight in your name. Open our hearts to your love, to your mercy, to your great truth. We thank you, O oh Lord that we can be here in your presence with you and with one another. Make your life alive and real in us and in this place. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Someone saw in on my Twitter feed that we were having this service tonight. The person who saw it was a bishop in London, England, who responded immediately offering the prayers of the Anglican Diocese of London as both we gather this evening as well as tomorrow on the day of the memorial. And I responded back and I said, now our, our cities share a common heartache along with Manchester, New York City, the list went on and on. I actually went on the Wikipedia website and went to see the list of all of the places where there had been terrorist attacks since the Pulse shooting. It's actually an astonishing list of places literally all over the world. And yet, as we gather tonight one year later, I want to say that we're celebrating something that came out of that, that Scott Maxwell in his article yesterday in the Sentinel called resilience, one year after this massacre. Because we were not afraid to speak up, because we were not afraid to stand together, because we were not afraid even to face, in fact, some of the criticism of our neighbors who felt a little bit embarrassed that somehow this had happened on a Latino night at a gay nightclub. Would, have, would it have been better for them if it had been at a different place? How can one not respond to such an unspeakable act of horror? For to be silent is to acquiesce, to speak out, but better yet, to act with compassion in the face of such violence is to declare in a very clear way that God has made humanity for something better than degradation and violence. You see, for Christians, this is what God has shown us in His Son. Because in the midst of the horror of Roman oppression of Israel, the slaughter of people, for no reason at all, Jesus continued again and again and again to look at both victim and perpetrator and to speak words for and of forgiveness. You see, this hope that God has put in us that we've seen in Jesus, this longing for something new, is a part of what God has put in the heart of so many, both actually Christian and non-Christian. It is that hope that causes ordinary human beings to rise with courage beyond the norm and perform acts of heroism, grace, and kindness even in the face of atrocity. Because we have within us something that I believe that God has put in our DNA that longs for something bigger and deeper, more beautiful, and more at rest than anything that we presently know. Where does that come from if it does not come from heaven itself? Otherwise, why would we even know? Why would we even hope for something that we have not seen had not God put in us a longing that comes from His heart? and speaks of that place where there is no pain and where there is no grief, where God, in fact, wipes away every tear from every eye, a place of extraordinary light 
where death and violence are but a very, very dim memory, and where we gather, to quote the Isaiah reading, is on this great mountain, an extraordinary feast of wonderful food and of great wine, the capacity to be able to laugh and enjoy one another's company without the survivor guilt or the fear that somehow we're not paying enough attention to the needs of the broken, because we will be in that place where all has been restored, where all has been healed, where God is manifesting Himself in the fulfillment of His own declaration when He says, see, I am making all things new. That hunger for that place is what divinity has put within mortal humanity, a longing for eternity. Otherwise, we are the most miserable and naive of people. Otherwise, the cynic looks at us and says, you know, it never gets any better, and you've just got to learn how to live through it. And while learning how to live through it is better advice than being absorbed by it, I want to say that there is another step beyond the living through it. It's a way of living through it, a way where God begins to put in us that kind of poise, that kind of vitality that, in fact, supernaturally working within us the capacity to be able to reach out to say no to the fear, even though it is certainly there in the midst of the horror, to reach out anyway, to stand in the midst of others who might feel more afraid than we do, and step out anyway. That's the courageous work that God puts in us. And why in the world would we even begin to do it? If life was meaningless, if it was just another death and none of us really mattered in the face of anything at all, we're just a number and we're an accident and life really isn't going to get any better. No, no, no. This hope for this brighter future is the very work of God. But it's not just courage and resilience. It's actually a step further than that. It's actually at its best at its most sublime, the capacity to forgive. Henri Nouwen, one of my favorite authors, says, forgiveness stands at the center of God's love for us and also at the center of our love for each other. You see, what stands at the center of God's love has to be forgiveness not merely acquiescence, even acceptance, but it's something deeper than that because the divisions and the brokenness that exist are not just an out there phenomena, it's an in here phenomenon. It's inside of the places in my heart that I wish weren't there. It's in those things that happen inside of my mind, even if I don't act upon them, of which I wish were never ever a part of who I am. The prayer book says the things that we have both done as well as left undone, the errors that exist within the human heart, the rage that is inside of you and me, the fears and the longings that we try to sort of assemble in the midst of trying to get through our day, all of that needs divinity to touch at its very core if we are going to be anything other than people who are just learning how to get their act together. Like I said, I'd rather be with people who are learning how to get their act together than people who are just a train wreck all the time, although sometimes I feel like that, don't you? But even in the midst of the worst of those inner situations, the responses that I wish weren't there, there is something deeply at work that invites me to something bigger and better than that. And it is, in fact, the call both to forgive and to be forgiven. Because <laughs> if there's a scale in heaven about who's better than others, I would have no idea where I would fall. And neither do you, quite honestly. 
No, what allows you and I to stand in the presence of God and to be recipients of this kind of supernatural power is the prevenient, preeminent mercy and forgiveness that comes to us unbidden at the very heart of the very love of God. It is epitomized in what we see on the cross where Jesus, the recipient of the worst violence of humankind, nailed to the cross to die for ever until he is resurrected by God, cries out in the midst of all of that, countering the violence by saying, Father, what? Forgive them. Not, okay, time for the lightning bolts. Give them what they deserve. No. And it is exactly in that spot, whether I am the perpetrator or the victim, where I stand as closely as I can to that place by the cross so that when Jesus says, Father, forgive them, the little cry within me, because sometimes that's all I can muster, is, oh, just Jesus, please, me too. And them too as well. Forgive them when I feel like I can't. Forgive them when I want anything but forgiveness. Don't let the smallness of my own resentments determine their future. Please, God, I thank you, O Lord, that you are bigger than that. So that it is forgiveness that stands at the center of God's love. And if forgiveness is what courses through the very heart of God, even for the worst of humanity, both for victims as well as perpetrator, all of whose names are on this stall, then there is, in fact, hope for humanity. Then the cleansing, in fact, can be possible, that the new heaven and the new earth, the feast of aged wine, the sense that somehow in the midst of all of the things that are more painful than we could even begin to understand, that God is relentlessly working in a way that will, in fact, in the end, make all things new. It is forgiveness that makes that possible, that vision which captivates the human heart and gives us the capacity to be able to live with the courage and the poise to say no to the fear most of the time and to do what we can with His energy, God's energy, to step out in love. In the Brothers Karamazov, Fyodor Dostoevsky writes these words, I believe, like a child, that suffering will be healed and made up for that all the humili humiliating absurdity of human contradictions will vanish like a pitiful mirage, like the despicable fabrication of the impotent and infinitely small mind of man. And that in the world's finale, at the moment of eternal harmony, something so precious will come to pass that it will suffice for all the hearts for the comforting of all resentments and for the atonement of all the crimes of humanity. That's what I believe. I believe with all of my heart. That's what the Scripture teaches. So that regardless of what this community faces, it will be a resilience, but yes, not a resilience based Finally, on determination and resentment, that only gets you so far. Not even a resilience based on determining to choose to, right, to do the right thing, because that only gets you so far. But instead, the resilience that comes out of a heart that is, in fact, being changed by God. So that we could, in fact, be as... Many Christians sing the prayer of St. Francis, a channel of your peace. Not my best effort, but your, your peace, O oh God. So that in the worst of, worst of difficulties, we may love, 
not with the fragility of our own human heart, but with a courage and a grace that goes beyond our own internal prejudices, our own incapacities, because it is that love that conquers death. It is that love that raised Jesus from the dead. It is that love that gives us the courage, the resilience, the determination, and the grace to be here and to choose by God's mercy to be a witness of love in this community, not just tomorrow on Orlando United Day, but buoyed by the prayers of many across this planet every day, even when we don't feel like it, because it is His love that is stronger than anything. Amen.